On August 28, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the I Have a Dream speech to more than 250,000 civil rights supporters at the Lincoln Memorial during the March on Washington. During the speech, Dr. King challenged Americans to judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Referring to his concept of racial equality, he also challenged people from various backgrounds to come together in brotherhood and sisterhood, referring to his concept of integration. Now I'm going to play an excerpt of the speech. Afterwards, we will examine passages from the excerpt in greater detail to focus our discussion regarding the themes of integration and racial equality. Okay, so we're very familiar with those passages uh, for sure, but I'd like to um, examine uh, those passages uh, or examine specific passages from this excerpt that we just listened to. The reason for this close examination of Dr. King's speech is to highlight the context of the time in which Dr. King gave his speech, where we were, and also highlight the emergence of the themes of integration and racial equality, which are the focus of this talk. Dr. King was a master orator. He was very deliberate in the use of every word he spoke. For example, in this passage, I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down at the table of brotherhood. I believe one of the reasons he mentioned Georgia was because he was born in Atlanta. He lived the experience of segregation in the South, in particular in Georgia. The sons of former slaves uh, were of course blacks and the sons of former slave owners were of course whites. While Dr. King could have just said that he had a dream for blacks and whites to be able to sit down together, I believe he used the term sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners to reference a legacy of slavery in which interactions among blacks and whites were quite different and quite brutal, while also stating that the nation could move beyond this painful legacy to a brighter day. Also, Dr. King did not just say that he had a dream for blacks and whites to sit down together at a table. He had a dream for blacks and whites to sit down together at the table of brotherhood, meaning he didn't just want blacks and whites to be in a room together, but for there to be relationship, genuine relationship akin to the type of relationship brothers have. Now, of course, brothers can disagree and brothers can even fight sometimes. <laughs> But because they are family, they usually try to find a way to work things out. 
this is the kind of dynamic, I think, that Dr. King dreamed of along racial lines. I think this was what Dr. King really meant regarding his conception with respect to integration. Dr. King also said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Here, Dr. King is dreaming of a nation where blacks are not treated differently, specifically where they are not treated as less than or as inferior to whites. He is dreaming of a nation where judgments about people are not race-based. During the time Dr. King gave his speech, blacks were treated as second-class citizens. So what, he's, what he was referring to in this particular passage was very much a dream far from the reality he had experienced and witnessed. The world in which he lived involved people making a series of assumptions about one's intelligence, competence, etc., simply by looking at one's skin color. He longed for a world where people looked beyond <laughs> skin color to examine one's character, thereby making an informed decision regarding an assessment of a person. Dr. King's conception of racial equality refers to race being a non-factor regarding character assessment. Dr. King also remarked, I have a dream that one day in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I think Dr. King focused specifically on Alabama here because undoubtedly opposition toward integration was strongest and most violent in Alabama during the time he gave this speech. I think Dr. King focused on children here because children are so innocent. Considering adults might cause one to focus on a specific person rather than the point he was really trying to make. Emphasis on children helps, I think, to bring humanity back into focus with regard for the need for integration. And as we saw earlier, brotherhood and sisterhood is a recurring theme in Dr. King's speech. It underscores his conception of integration. As noted earlier, Dr. King dreamed of a nation in which racial equality and integration could be realized. What this means for schools of information, which we refer to as iSchools, is that there should be racial equality and integration among students and faculty in iSchools. While I think we are taking steps toward racial equality and integration in iSchools, we are not quite there yet. In my opinion, roadblocks for iSchools to sufficiently address the two aspects of Dr. King's dream that are the focus of this talk are microaggressions. According to Dr. Daryl Wing Sue and colleagues at Columbia University, racial microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults toward people of color. Dr. Sue and colleagues identify three types of microaggressions, microassaults, microinsults, and microinvalidations. A microinsult is an explicit racial derogation characterized primarily by a verbal or nonverbal attack meant to hurt the intended victim through name calling, avoidant, behavior, or purposeful discriminatory actions. Referring to someone as colored or oriental, using racial epithets, discouraging interracial interactions, deliberately serving a white patron before someone of color, and displaying a swastika are examples. A microinsult is characterized by communications that convey rudeness, and insensitivity and demean a person's racial heritage or identity. Microinsults represent subtle snubs, frequently unknown to the perpetrator, 
but clearly convey a hidden, insulting message to the recipient of color. When a white employer tells a prospective candidate of color, I believe the most qualified person should get the job, regardless of race, or when an employee of color is asked, how did you get that job? The underlying message from the perspective of the recipient may be twofold. People of color are not qualified, and as a minority group member, you must have obtained the position through some affirmative action or quota program, and not because of ability. Micro invalidations are characterized by communications that exclude, negate, or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a person of color. When Asian Americans born and raised in the United States are complimented for speaking good English or are repeatedly asked where they were born, the effect is to negate their US American heritage and to convey that they are perpetual foreigners. When blacks are told that I don't see color or we are all human beings, the effect is to negate their experiences as racial and cultural beings. According to Dr. Sue and colleagues, microaggression creates psychological dilemmas that unless adequately resolved lead to increased levels of racial anger, mistrust, and loss of self-esteem for persons of color. Microaggressions also prevent white people from perceiving a different racial reality and create impediments to harmonious race relations. I would argue that in the context of iSchools, microaggressions can make underrepresented minorities feel like they do not belong, like they constantly have to justify their existence or constantly have to prove themselves. Microaggressions have the potential to make underrepresented minorities feel like they have to overperform just to be taken seriously at all. I also think that the threat of microaggressions causes students of color to be afraid to take risks and try new things for fear that their failures would somehow lend credibility to the stereotypes that have been perpetuated regarding specific racial groups. So what are iSchool's roles in making Dr. King's dream a reality? I argue that students and faculty in iSchools have to make sure that they judge their fellow students and faculty by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. Do not treat someone differently just because they are black or white. I also agree that students and faculty uh, need to join together in brotherhood and sisterhood. Now, I do not mean that we all hold hands in class or on the elevator to North Quad, but that we take seriously the idea that we ought to form meaningful and genuine relationships among one another to the exclusion and, and, and not just interact with a select group of people to the exclusion of others who may not think or look like you. Challenge yourself do better and grow. So what can recipients of microaggressions do? How can they defend or protect themselves? They can speak up when a microaggression occurs. They can report their experiences to faculty and administrators at iSchools. And if they do not do anything about it, uh, microaggression recipients can go to university administrators, such as the graduate school, to make them aware of their experiences. Your experience matters, your experience is valid, and you deserve to have your voice heard and your concerns addressed. Suppose you've never perpetuated or, or perpetrated a microaggression or been a recipient of a microaggression, but you want to help an iSchool achieve Dr. King's dream. You can help by validating the experience of microaggression recipients and expressing disagreement with uh, microaggression uh, perpetrators. 
For example, during a doctoral development seminar, which we refer to as DDS, a guest speaker uh, perpetrated a microassault on me. A white male graduate student who witnessed the microaggression came to me later that day and told me that witnessing the microaggression made him feel uncomfortable and angry. He also told me that he was going to go to that guest speaker's office hours and explain to him how it made him feel. This student's response made me feel supported because he validated my experience. That meant so much to me as a microaggression recipient. Supporting and validating the experience of microaggression recipients can have a powerful and very positive effect on microaggression recipients. What can I schools do when their students and faculty may include both perpetrators and recipients of microaggressions? Administrators of these programs can validate the experience of microaggression recipients. Do not try to sweep a microaggression under the rug. It happened and it must be dealt with. The worst thing one can do is after a microaggression has occurred, and a student has mustered up enough courage to share his or her experience, is to invalidate or otherwise ignore the student's experience. That compounds and exacerbates the impact of the initial microaggression. I think oftentimes this occurs in departments where politics supersede the experience of microaggression recipients. I argue that validating and supporting microaggression recipients ought to supersede departmental politics. This is what we should be. And why? Because our schools claim that they value diversity and specifically that they want to increase enrollment and retention of underrepresented minorities. This is a superb goal for iSchools. And I am glad that this is part of many iSchools agendas. But if microaggressions are occurring in iSchools, and underrepresented minorities feel that they are not being supported when these microaggressions occur, why should I schools focus on recruiting more underrepresented students if they cannot adequately support the students they currently have? And for microaggression perpetrators, you can help by stopping your behavior. <laughs> now, I realize that some perpetrators are unaware of the impact or the magnitude uh, and unaware that they are perpetrating microaggressions. But other perpetrators are well aware of what they're doing and, and are intending to have it have the effect. Um, this message is specifically for these kinds of microaggression perpetrators. Please stop. You are making people, both recipients and witnesses of microaggressions, feel uncomfortable upset, angry, and you are distracting people from doing the work that they came to iSchools to do. In summary, the heart of this presentation considered two aspects of Dr. King's dream, racial equality and integration. We also considered Dr. King's dream in the context of iSchools, identifying microaggressions as impediments to Dr. King's dream. I also provided recommendations for how, in lieu of microaggressions, students, faculty, and administrators can take actions to mitigate the impact of microaggressions and thereby get closer to realizing Dr. King's dream. I'd like to acknowledge the faculty advisor for MIX, Dr. Lionel Robert, um, the president of MIX, Ms. Nicole Robinson, and again, acknowledge Kellogg for their generous sponsorship and, and you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend.